Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. It's good to see you all on this uh, snowy afternoon in February, right? Before we know it, we'll be complaining about the humidity. So we'll, we'll enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> we did a cool snow tunnel earlier and it didn't collapse on any child. So I call that a win. Um, so welcome, welcome. We are now, I can't believe it, we're in week three of the, uh, of the research series. So time is really flying here. Um, last week, you might recall, Jamie uh, led a great discussion on her work, and, and we're turning this week to, uh, to another wonderful Ostrom Fellow from Anthropology, uh, Daphna Arachuk, who's going to be telling us a little bit about her work on development aid institutions and HIV in Ukraine. Incredibly important, timely, um, interesting topics, Daphna. So we we'll really look forward to hearing more about your work here. Just as a reminder, guys, after um, the presentation, feel free to use the chat box. You guys know the drill, the raise hand function, and I'll do my best to, uh, to keep the cue and uh, moderate from there. So unless you have any questions, Daphna, I'm happy to turn things over to you. And thanks so much again for the opportunity to uh, highlight your work here. Sure, Scott, thanks so much. I will then go ahead and I'll share my PowerPoint. Um, so hopefully you can all see it now. It has been like Perfect. so many months with Zoom and yet every time I have to do it from my screen, I have these butterflies in the stomach. Will it work or will it not work? So um, the title of my presentation today is Developmental Aid Institution and HIV in Ukraine. And this is a little bit of preliminary research that I'm doing before hopefully, fingers crossed, pandemic permitting, I will be able to go and do my dissertation research. So I was just um, um, looking at some of the documents that I was able to access during the pandemic and basically trying to understand how it all like fits into my research. And I really, really want to thank um, the Ostrom Workshop who has provided me with a community of open-minded um, people who were also like really, really supportive of my work. And I also want to thank Department of Anthropology and my um, advisor and mentor, Sarah Phillips. So I think I'll start by giving some background and introduction to my topic. So um, uh, the HIV epidemic came to the post-Soviet space uh, rather late. The first case of HIV um, in Ukraine was reported in 1987. And for, compar for comparison, the first case of HIV in the US was identified six years earlier in 1981. And most researchers agree that uh, since the end of the 1980s and throughout the 1990s, the spread of HIV in the USSR and in general and uh, in Ukraine in particular was predominantly connected to drug use. Sexual contacts as the main path of transmission of the virus. Um, they were rather unimportant before the late 1990s, early 2000s. And it was only in the mid uh, 2000s that heterosexual sexual contacts became responsible for the majority of transmission cases. And in relation to Ukraine, it is often agreed that sexual transmission has been driving the epidemic since, era since around 2008. And um, However, and even though the HIV epidemic um, continued to be limited only to people who inject drugs in their networks in the mid-1990s, the annual incidence of new cases of HIV really started to dramatically increase from dozens to thousands. And by the end of the 2000s, there were more than um, 160,000 cases of HIV in Ukraine and more than um, 18,000 deaths from AIDS. And it is really important to mention here that um, scholars often argue that, well, the official reported data about HIV in Ukraine, they may really, really underestimate the uh, information and the numbers that are out there. So unfortunately, it, will, it may well be the case that a significant proportion of population that is infected with HIV really is not aware of this fact. So they kind of like do not make it into these uh, reports because we are talking mostly about uh, individuals who have been tested, diagnosed with HIV and included into official statistics, which is of course, so like we're not counting every um, individual with HIV. So, as of uh, 2018, UNAIDS report that in Ukraine, out of all newly diagnosed cases, sexual transmission accounts for more than 70% of cases and the uh, injection drug use only for the quarter of all, of all cases. 
And also in um, 2017, Ukraine joined UNAIDS efforts to reach uh, the 1990 90 fast track targets and pledged to end its epidemic by the year of uh, 2030. And I'll just give some context that countries that pledged to reach the 1990-90 uh, fast track targets, they work on um, making sure that 90% of all people who live with HIV, they know their status and that out of these uh, people, 90% uh, receive antiretroviral viral therapy. And then out of that, um, 90, uh, 90 people are, uh, are vir virally suppressed. However, uh, Ukraine a little bit lags behind those targets, and, and of the and as um, of the year uh, 2019, it is estimated that only around 60% of all people who live with HIV know about uh, their status. However, all in all, Ukraine ex exhibited a steadily progress towards fighting the epidemic. However, then uh, the conflict in in the eastern part of the country in the Donbas happened. And according to some scholars, uh, because of the people like running away from the war affected areas, the situation with HIV in the country um, may have worsened a little bit because well, people are moving around and especially people from really populated areas and people who may not really know their like HIV status are also like, moving from other, moving to new areas. So what does it have to do with my paper? Um, basically, in my paper, I'm trying to analyze the, the cooperation between the Global Fund um, to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, and it, it has this very long name, so afterwards I will refer to this entity just as the Global Fund. So I'm trying to analyze the cooperation between this entity, the Ministry of Health, and the Alliance for Public um, Health, an NGO. In order basically to understand why the initial cooperation between the Global Fund and the Ministry of Health was not really successful. So then the fund basically transferred uh, most of its activities uh, to NGO and decided that, well, we don't want really to deal with the state entities anymore. And basically um, I'm trying to apply the institutional analysis and developmental um, development framework. And uh, in particular, I'm uh, zooming in on the participants, the rules, the choice rules and the information rules. And as my sources, I'm using um, available documents like reports uh, produced by the global funds, by the ministry, by the NGOs that were, that were contracted and subcontracted by the global fund. And also I'm using, of course, scholarly literature that was written um, on this cooperation. So here is the institutional analysis and development framework that we all are um, hopefully really familiar with. And um, regarding the uh, institutional analysis and development of framework, um, I want really uh, to, um, to emphasize that um, for anthropologists, this framework presents um, a useful tool that allows to bring forth the focus on the language and culture aspects of the institutions. And basically to look at the role that understandings and misunderstandings, miscommunication and beliefs play in shaping institutions and the outcomes of action. And what I particularly like about the IED is its focus on the connections between the components. So, um, and this is basically like my take on the IED in my case. This is how I adapted it, so to say, to um, analyze the development between the global fund, the ministry and the NGOs. It's just like uh, a little bit of context here, it is important to say that um, basically when HIV epidemic hit Ukraine, um, its economy was um, contracting annually, which kind of like resulted in the country not really being able to spend a lot on its uh, public health system. And though the article um, 49 of the Constitution of Ukraine guarantees everyone access to health care services and public facilities, Healthcare system in Ukraine is constantly underfunded, which has led to a proliferation of various co-payments, but also it has led to um, the influx of various um, international donors like the Global One Fund who have been kind of like giving money to, to the country to fight its HIV epidemic. And just like to give you um, an idea, according to the World Health Organization, Ukraine's spending on health as a share of GDP has been consistently low, and the peak that Ukraine has ever like spent on its healthcare as a percentage of GDP was 3.8%. Um, 
and it has it, it it was in 2015 and it has been like um decreasing uh since that time and basically ukraine spending on healthcare has been consistently below the average for the countries in the who european region and it also has been slightly below the average even for the uh, lower middle lower middle income countries so um, it is also important to mention that after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, a lot of the countries um, in the post-Soviet region, they started reorganizing their public health systems because it was really incredibly difficult for them to um, support a universal free care from the state budget. And Ukraine started its health care reforms um, relatively late, endeavoring to change the public um, endeavoring to change the delivery of health services only in 2015. And it is interesting that these health reforms are really like still ongoing, still in process in Ukraine. But what is especially interesting for um, social scientists is that the exact changes that this reorganization will bring, they're somewhat fuzzy for, for a lot of people. So it is a great um, area for scholarly exploration. So, um, as I said, because of the constantly underfunded public health system and because of the continuing HIV epidemic in Ukraine, there is a plethora of international donors that who have been um, uh, helping Ukraine to, to uh, fight its um, HIV epidemic. And uh, in my uh, paper, in my presentation, I focus on one of such donors, the um, Global Fund. So the main participants that I focus on in this analysis are the Global Fund, the Ministry of Health, um, and then also like the Alliance for Public, uh, for Public Health and the like smaller NGOs that were subcontracted by the Alliance for Public Health in order to work with the target groups um, on the ground. And the target groups are people who use drugs, commercial sex workers, and men who have sex with men. So in order to understand why the outcomes of cooperation um, for the Global Fund were better when it worked with the Alliance for Public Health, I think that it is important to factor in rules and importance of culture. In this case, importance of beliefs about HIV and of bureaucratic routines. So uh, in 2003, the Global Fund signed an agreement of cooperation with the Ukrainian Ministry of Health, choosing the ministry to be its main recipient. And the Ministry of Health was then responsible for recruiting and, and enrolling uh, subrecipients who were in their turn responsible for carrying out outreach work and harm reduction strategies on the ground. However, just one year later in 2004, the Ministry and the Global Fund, they had a conflict related to money management and to the results that were accomplished with the Global Fund's money. And after the conflict, the fund discontinued its work with the Ministry of Health and chose the um, Alliance for Public Health instead. And the Alliance has been managing fund grants to Ukraine uh, for um, more than a decade. So um, I think that in order to understand the nature of the conflict between the Global Fund and the Ministry of Health and the success of the fund's cooperation with the Alliance, it is important to look at the rules and use that the fund, the Alliance, and the Ministry of Health um, agreed to and held important. And in addition, I think that it is also necessary to look at the attributes of community. And in this case, cultural beliefs that informed all sides approach to cooperation. Um, so um, as, I, as I have said before, the post-Soviet space in Ukraine in particular, um, they were hit by HIV epidemic at a time of significant economic instability. So in the 90s, when the epidemic was growing in Ukraine, Ukraine's economy also contracted annually between 9.7 uh, and 22.7%. So um, it, was, it, was not, it was not a fun time. Um, however, it is not just this like, dire material condition that has to be considered. It is also important, again, like, to focus on the attributes of community. And um, here I am also drawing on the work of um, Clement and Whaley, who have pointed out that sometimes the IED framework may, some, may sometimes like put too much uh, into the attributes of community box. So they propose basically to unpack this box into a few different components, like political economy, social attributes, and discourse. And for the purposes of my paper, this um, idea of the discourse is precisely the thing that I focus um, most on. 
So um, now to the cultural goals. So unlike the alliance and the NGOs that it um, subcontracted, the environment in the Ministry of Health was characterized by a relative lack of knowledge about HIV and the effective harm reduction strategy when the ministry was contracted by the Global Fund. Moreover, as observed by uh, some medical anthropologists, a lot of drug treatment programs based in public clinics, um, that is clinics that reported to the Ministry of Health, they, uh, they really put a lot of emphasis on the patient's will as an important element of their success. And unfortunately, such um, medical approach may really bracket the social context of drug use and sometimes reinforce the blame and thus decrease the patient's willingness to cooperate and to interact with medical professionals. And such beliefs that individuate the responsibility for the substance use and for being HIV positive were rather widespread among the uh, ministry officials and their subrecipients and led to a situation when the target groups, that is people who use drugs, commercial sex workers, and men who have sex with men, they became really increasingly unwilling to cooperate with the ministry um, representatives. And this situation was also exacerbated by the fact that the ministerial representatives, by virtue of being state employees, they were also seen as suspicious and untrustworthy because of the because they kind of like represented the state that criminalized the very communities it sought um, it sought to help. That it it basically criminalized the communities that it needed to accomplish its programs. For instance, sex work in Ukraine, though kind of like not criminalized for savages and administrative offense. However, uh, pimping and procuring are criminalized by articles of the criminal code um, 303 and 302 respectively. And thus sex workers who work as independent contractors, they um, have been often charged by loosely interpreted articles of the criminal code. And uh, drug use is also criminalized in Ukraine by a plethora of various articles in the criminal code. And also there is an article that basically uh, that effectively criminalizes HIV transmission. And um, according to the chairman of the board of the Eurasia uh, Women's Network on AIDS, Svetlana Maroz, um, this article that makes the target communities and the HIV positive people really um, uh, target groups to criminal prosecution. And given this legal landscape, it's really quite unsurprised, and unsurprising that the target groups that the Minister of Health uh, subrecipients had to work with were often like quite not trusting and quite unwilling to work with the state representatives and they were quite uncooperative. So unlike the Minister of Health who mostly employed uh, people out of, out of target communities and unlike who were, and that these people they were also rather unfamiliar with the communities they were working uh, with. The Alliance for Public Health and the NGOs that it subcontracted um, for its uh, global fund grant, they chose a different strategy. So basically they employed a lot of people who were belonging to the communities that they were working with. So they um, employed a lot of people who were former or current drug, us drug users themselves, um, commercial sex workers and men who have sex with men. And being familiar with the needs of the target groups uh, and their socioeconomic situation, basically allowed the Alliance and its subrecipients to better reach out to, to the target groups as the NGOs were drawing also like on an already established relationship. They employed these sort of like peer-to-peer -peer approach, for instance, when like sex workers were reaching out to sex workers and former or current drug users were reaching out to drug users. And this allowed um, the Alliance and its recipients to widen its outreach base. Moreover, by virtue of being like both members of the community and not being representatives of the state, the employees um, of the subrecipient NGOs, they were also like way more trusted than the um, state representatives that the employees of the ministry. And uh, in this respect, I think that the current transformation of public health in Ukraine presents a really interesting research puzzle because um, the global fund is supposed to withdraw from the country so the state is supposed to assume the responsibility for the provision of HIV related services quite soon. And these responsibilities um, that are related to HIV services, they fall um, under purview of the new office, partly new, partly reorganized entities called Centers for Public Health. And the centers, they um, had this interesting strategy as they started to employ people um, who had previously worked in the NGOs like the Alliance for Public Health. 
So I think it is very interesting to see whether the legitimacy of like former NGO workers will kind of um, linger as they transition to work for the state um, or um, whether it will kind of, or whether they will um, stop being like trust, trustworthy people when they kind of like start being the employees of the state. So um, now um, I want to talk about the rules a little bit. And for the purposes of this presentation and for the purposes of this research, I focus mostly on the information rule and choice rules. As Eleanor Oscar mentioned, choice rules specify what a participant occupying a position must, must not, or may do at a particular point in a decision process in light of conditions that have or have not been met at that point in the process. So an example of the choice rules would be, for instance, a social worker who is authorizing welfare payment uh, for an applicant after the worker assured that the applicant um, meets the criteria. Or in the case that I analyze, an example of choice, rule, of choice rules would be an employee of a sub-recipient of either the Alliance or the Ministry of Public Health deciding whether to proceed with syringe exchange and assessing whether the person in front of them is really a proper representative of a target group or not. According to medical anthropologist Jennifer Carroll, NGO employees, unlike the Minister of Health, had a greater space for discretion and a greater wiggle room that allowed them to successfully adjust the donors, that is the global fund demands, with the situation on the ground. In other words, the NGO's uh, choice rules were more flexible than the choice rules of the Ministry of Health. The ministry's strict and centralized and like very top down system provided its employees and the uh, ministry subrecipients with less, with little to no wiggle room to accommodate the donors' requirements to the local realities. For instance, it was really difficult for people who use drugs to bring a bag full of used syringes uh, to an NGO to exchange them for the NGO ones because of the fear of being caught by the police in charge for the possession and distribution of drugs. And understanding this fear, the NGOs frequently did not mention in their reports back to the donor um, the number of syringes collected um, as, the report, as the report requirement did not really explicitly ask for these. So basically they were kind of um, making, thinking that well like the donor will think that a one-to-one -one exchange always occurs and basically this allowed the NGOs to accommodate the needs of the target group while also accommodating the requirements of the global fund for the exchange and though the paperwork the paper trail that the NGOs may have uh, sometimes presented contrasted with their actual practices by resorting to such tactics tactics and bending their choice rules the angels were able to get the work done while the Ministry of Health with its stricter reporting rules was worse positioned to accomplish this. So um, now about information rules. So according to Eleanor Ostrom, I quote, information rules affect the level of information available to participants. Information rules authorize channels of information flow among participants, assign the obligation, permission, or prohibition to communicate to participants in positions of particular decision mode, and the language and form in which communication takes will take place. Um, end of the quote. So focusing on the information rules, in other words, helps to shed light on the misunderstandings and miscommunications that may arise or have already arisen among participants and on the ways to fix them. So, um, and within the scope of information rules, Eleanor Ostrom really notes that it is important to take into account the channels of information flow, frequency, frequency and accuracy of communication and the subject of communication and the official language. And um, I think that in this case, in the case that I'm analyzing, it is the official language and the terminology that was crucial for a successful cooperation between participants. So the crucial concepts around which the partnership between the Global Fund and the Ministry and then the Alliance uh, was built are the concepts of development and sustainability. And as Gibson and colleagues have observed, disagreements about the core concepts and missing or asymmetric information flows may compromise the outcomes of the developmental aid. And um, for Global Fund, the focus on the development meant focus on the institutions in the recipient countries. The fund stressed the importance of mutual responsibility and accountability, the need for multi multi sorry, multilateral approach to designing and implementing health-related strategies, and the importance of engaging the target group. 
and most importantly, the fund was open to recipient countries creating their own models of development as soon as those models are seen. And it is interesting to note here that uh, quite similarly to the Global Fund, the Alliance was also being quite clear about its ideas on what development means. The Alliance, for instance, stressed in its, doc in its documents and in its reports, the importance and necessity of a multilateral approach to stopping the HIV epidemic of engaging uh, HIV epidemic of engaging the target group. And this NGO has also been quite clear about the fact that those donors' money they are incredibly important to stopping the epidemic because like the um, because the state of Ukraine is not really able to fund it on its own. Um, it is really important to account for the local conditions and to the interest of the target to the target group. Basically, the alliance stated that there has to be some kind of like reaching the middle ground between what the donor wants and what the situation on the ground um, really is. And by contrast, if you look at the different like documents produced by the ministry, um, their stance on development was um, less than clear, so to say. Though the regional agreement, for instance, between the fund and the, and the ministry mentions the goal of development like more than um, like around like five times, it doesn't really specify what the development meant um, for the main recipients. And also the agreement mentioned the importance of multilateralism in defining health related strategies, but it really did not specify who those sites are and whether the target groups um, have to be included. And I was really, really unsuccessful in finding like any documents from the ministry that were like, quite clear on what development, what sustainability, and what the multilateral multi approach means to them. So um, unfortunately, um, as we can see, um, um, the, co the cooperation uh, between the Global Fund and the Ukrainian Ministry of Health, it was the unspoken but not agreed upon assumptions and different and not agreed upon choice rules that may have brought unfavorable outcomes to the participants and even like put future efforts of cooperation in jeopardy. And still I want to bring us back to the current, to the ongoing um, reform in the healthcare, um, in, the, in the public health in Ukraine. And I think it would be really interesting to investigate whether the Ministry of Health learned from its experience and whether um, they basically changed its behavior when like cooperating with um, with the donor. So um, hoping that I haven't uh, yet bored you to death with my presentation, I'll now proceed to some of my uh, preliminary conclusions and future directions. So when Ukrainian media just because the ministries failed cooperation with the Global Fund, they often explain this failure in terms of corruption. So basically, according to them, the Minister of Health, they just simply packed with uh, corrupt individuals who cannot be trusted with money. However, from an anthropological point of view, and um, as a scholar um, who follows the work of Eleanor Ostrom, I think that such an explanation is hardly sufficient because basically, instead of asking how and why, it really individualizes the responsibility and essentially puts the full stop where one really should start asking questions. So um, I hope that, um, as I have shown, the failure of cooperation between the ministry and the Global Fund can be explained better by looking at the mismatch in the information rules and the choice rules and the attributes of community. The failure in this cooperation can also be explained by the belief that Ministry of Health officials helped about HIV that prevented them from properly reaching out to the target group and accomplishing the goal. And finally, it was lack of trust with the state representatives that the Ministry of Health representatives and the first state representatives from the target groups due to the legal landscape. So like in other words, this failure in cooperation, it was an institutional problem. And coming back um, once again to the current transformation in the public health care system in Ukraine, it is an interesting research problem to look at whether the Ministry of Health will really learn its lesson. So the health care reform that is ongoing in Ukraine promises greater decentralization of the um, health care sphere. And some scholars like an Ostrom affiliate, Alan Zerichta, have pointed out decentralization may really bring significant improvement, improvements in the delivery of health care services. So um, given the fact that the Minister of Health is now more willingly also like employs people who have extensive um, experience working in um, 
and you know, and um, who have been like at the forefront of harm reduction work in the country. It would be also interesting to see whether the ministry is now more prone to adopt a multi multilateral approach to healthcare and to allow the representative from the target groups, the NGOs, and the private sector to access the, negoci the um, negotiation table. And finally, it would be also really important to access how all the ongoing changes they have affected the delivery of HIV services. So um, as probably was clear from my presentation, this unfolding public health care reform is something that I'm really, really interested in. And um, by the dam at meeting, really keeping my fingers crossed, hopefully like next fall, I'll go to the field and start digging um, some of the questions that I have um, outlined on the slide. And I think that my time is up. So Thank you so much for bearing with me and um, I'm happy to take uh, your questions. Very well done, Daphna. Please join me <laughs> in thanking Daphna for your excellent presentation. Um, really, really appreciate that. So much to chew on. Um, so the, uh, the queue is open, but maybe just to help um, get us started, guys. And again, feel free to use the raise hand feature, chat, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, I, I just had a couple of really quick questions, Daphna. One is just kind of a table setting question of how this particular paper, this project fits in with your overarching you know, research agenda. Is this part of your dissertation, just a chapter out of it, you know, for example? And, and that could help relate to my other question, which is you know, this, this point that you're raising about how these different stakeholders are working together, the Global Fund, the Ministry of Health, this, this NGO community. It, it, it's, it seems to be also screaming out for maybe an exercise in applying some of the principles of polycentric governance here too. And I'm wondering maybe that's done elsewhere um, or in another project. So I was just hoping you can comment on both of those. Um, and then if we had time, I'd love to hear more about how any of this you see playing out also in the COVID context um, in, uh, in Ukraine too, but we, we can return to that. Uh, but yeah, any quick reactions along those lines would be welcome, Daphna. Sure, uh, so yeah, I'm really, um... Like the main thing that I'm interested in, like for my dissertation, is this like ongoing um, transformation in the public health service. But the transformation it didn't start in the vacuum, right? So it had a very particular history too. So um, what I have uh, presented today, it's a part of this history that basically like inspired some of these uh, transformation that are ongoing in the public health uh, sphere. So um, out of uh, this presentation, I'm hoping to. Uh, tease out a chapter for my future dissertation, basically like explaining like what was going on with the Ukrainian like medical system uh, from, from um, the country independence on basically how the um, delivery of HIV services and the developmental aid fit there and basically how it brought us um, up to this point where we are now. And um, as to the question of like polycentricity, I don't know, but Probably y'all remember that uh, at the very first meeting of Austrian people, I introduced myself as like, hi, I'm Daphne and I'm really interested in polycentricity. So this is still held because uh, as you can see, this idea like of polycentric governance, uh, it is really, really relevant for my research. And I would, I haven't really started um, applying it in my research as much as I would like to, but I really see it as a kind of like nodal point to die to tie everything together. And I think that like maybe like maybe another chapter will be kind of uh, playing with the concept of polycentricity and thinking how it fits, maybe how it has to be like modified and a little bit like amended to explain again, like what goes on in the public health sphere in Ukraine and what are the, so to say like do's and don'ts, what are the pros and what are the cons of what is going on. It's a lot to take on. <laughs> I, I, I totally am with you there. Yeah. Um, and have you, have you already been in touch with, for example, Mike McGinnis about some of that as well? Not yet. Daphne? Just because of his current work in the healthcare context and really thinking about the benefits and drawbacks, frankly, of polycentricity, that might be kind of a fun connection to make. So a after we finish up here, I'll be happy to connect you too. And, and just as schedules permit, <laughs> um, you guys can uh, maybe touch base too. But I, I don't want to monopolize this too much. Thank you so much. I know um, it looks like Jamie uh, had maybe a question for you, so we can turn to her next. Yeah, Daphne, I really loved your presentation, and it's just fun to watch your work unfold in so many great ways. 
Um, I had a couple of questions. One is, I know you're talking about the public health aspect, but at least it makes me wonder, is there a private health aspect that's contributing to this problem as that's contributing to solutions as well? Because when I think about the AIDS epidemic here in the US, for instance, we've had a lot of private healthcare resources. And by that, I mean like individuals choosing their own doctors in some cases and having in, like private insurance pay for it rather than you know, it's like it's a, it's a mixture of public and private here in the U.S. Let me put it that way. Um, and so I'm wondering if you see that same mixture in the Ukraine. And also, you mentioned something about culture, and I kind of missed what you said because I stepped away to, to get this book so I could compare like your chart, like Lynn's understanding institutional diversity, so I could compare your um, your chart with her, you know, with, of of the ID framework with hers, just to see like to keep track with you. <laughs> so I missed what you said about culture, but it it led me to a question um, about, about the cultural aspect. Do you find that outside donors, like um, the, did you say the global fund, global fund, are they impacting the culture in Ukraine surrounding healthcare? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That, uh, that are awesome questions. So um, first of all, about the like private, the private aspect of the healthcare. So um, the thing is that uh, the healthcare system in Ukraine is organized in a very, very different way than from how it presents itself in the US. Because basically um, in, the Soviet, uh, in, this, um, in the Soviet Union, there was the so-called like the Samashka system, which was like a centralized universal uh, free healthcare system for all um, on paper. Um, it, didn't often function as a free, uh, super accessible healthcare system for all. So that's why these um, like informal like payments and like co-payments that I mentioned, because again, like how things look on the paper and how things are on the ground, well, these are where like we anthropologists come in. So um, this is like how it was for a really long period of time. And this is the kind of like uh, healthcare system that Ukraine really, really inherited from the Soviet Union. However, from um, 1991, from the year that Ukraine um, uh, gained its independence, a lot of uh, private clinics and like the ability of uh, to buy private insurance, of course, um, all of these all of these things appeared. But they were, but also they were kind of like limit the amount of people that like had access to that were very limited. So those uh, private clinics, they were not like as visible and especially they really were not at the like forefront of the um, fight to, of the fight to combat the HIV. And the current transformation of the public, uh, of the, um, in the public healthcare system, it's really interesting because it uh, kind of like incorporates also the uh, private sector more than the private sector used to be incorporated. Because now as, um, for instance, if one of the changes that this um, transformation that this reorganization um, has brought is the ability for the citizens of Ukraine basically to sign an agreement with the doctor, like stating that like, well, like, I choose you to be my family doctor and you can choose uh, this doctor both from the network of the um, doctors who work in the public facilities and also from the networks of doctors who work in the private facilities. So now, now the private clinics, they are kind of like better like incorporated into their, yeah, they are like more incorporated into the um, um, healthcare sphere than they, than they used to be. However, again, like we'll see how it, how it turns out to be because it's um, the healthcare reform started only five years ago and it's still unfolding. And the kind of like the second phase started only six months ago. So I don't know, like I'm really like what worry about giving out um like you know like rounded up conclusions about like what has happened because well it's it's still in progress. It's still very much unfolding. And uh, yeah as to the questions about culture um I think that in the in her book Understanding Institutional Divorce Diversity Eleanor Ostrom she talks about different like game experiments um conducted in different cultural settings and how cultural settings basically has an um, has an impact on the outcome of the game, right? So that's what I had in mind when I was talking about um, about culture. 
and um, I was also thinking about like beliefs that we have um, for instance that believes that the uh, employees of the ministry had when they went um, on the ground to do their outreach work right and um, as to your question about the global fund and whether it um, it has any impact on the institutional culture in Ukraine the answer is well yes hell yes of course and I think that these kind of like greater like polycentricity, if you wish, that you are start that you are starting to see in the um, healthcare sector in Ukraine. I think the Global Fund and donors like them, they have they contributed a lot to these um, to the more prominence of the uh, like private sector and like public clinics, like gaining like more prominence in the um, healthcare sphere. Did I address all of your questions? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the questions. They are very um, thought provoking. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Jamie. And it looks like we have uh, just in the order of the screen here, Brian and then Sarah. Okay, good. Um, interesting presentation and the paper was nice and clear about what it presented. I have a couple of comments and then question, which is actually Scott's question um, also. Um, so, First, uh, just a minor comment on the paper and like what Jamie was maybe mentioning, use the standard IED diagram. I think it might be nice either in that or a second ver expanded version to show more clearly where um, information and beliefs and things come in, both to remind those of us who should remember all that but don't necessarily, as well as just for readers who um, don't know that and just show how you're thinking about that. Um, for continuity with my talk on Monday, I'll point out that the um, model of donor recipient relations that Daphne is using is Samaritan's Dilemma from the book by Gibson and Lynn and others, uh, which is a simple two by two game. And, you know, the um, donors the global fund was using the kind of classic answer of trying to use conditionality make requirements and it didn't work. And then it took, and this is where it becomes polycentric, it took the option of, okay, you won't do what we want, we'll work with somebody else. And then it sounds now, and what gets interesting from hearing is, okay, that option is not there, or they're trying to work with the ministry, but there are also other players. So that seems like it would be fun to um, look at. And it's totally outside the scope of what you claim to present. But like Scott, I would be quite interested if you have comments on how any of this helps understand what may have been happening with COVID in the Ukraine. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, like I haven't like really looked a lot about like what is happening with COVID because I don't know. Um, it's just like when your research side is you're like, home country a lot of that is like happening is like literally too close to home so sometimes you're like just like yeah I don't want to know what is <laughs> I don't want to know what is going on here but uh just some of the um like as I was following the situation the thing with uh the COVID is um it, it was an interesting development because again, like the um, Ministry of Health was like supposed like to step up and to um, into place in order like for the vaccines to be um, to be to buy and like to be transported for, um, to for the vaccines to be transported to Ukraine, right? But like at the same time, Ukraine is also of a part of these like global COVAX initiative that is uh, like run by the um, WHO organization. And basically, so far, we are in the situation when the um, initial contract of the ministry with the vaccine developer, it wasn't really successful. So as of recently, Ukraine didn't have really any, um, any agreements about the vaccine being delivered to the country. So like so far, the only hope is for the like COVAX um, initiative and for the WHO efforts to like bring the vaccines to Ukraine. So again, like so far, like the state hasn't really been to, hasn't, re wasn't really able to kind of like hold to its end of the bargain, so to say, and like to like step in effectively. So again, like we're now like relying on the, um, not like not on the donors, but on the like supranational like entities 
to uh, secure the health of the population. Great. Did you have any follow-up, Brian? Are you okay? No, no. Okay. Thank you so much, Daphne. Yeah. And then Sarah, please. Thank you, Daphna. Congratulations on a wonderful presentation. Very well done. I have a, a short question and actually a short observation and then a question. Um, my comment is I really love the starting point of your paper. Uh, the fact that it is so often assumed that what went wrong with the ministry and the Global Fund cooperation is rooted entirely in some kind of nefarious acts, corruption, that sort of thing. And I love how you start out by not only questioning that assumption, but saying, you know, we have the tools and um, the insights to get deeper into the story. So I really love that. And I actually thought you could foreground that a little more at the beginning of your paper, instead of kind of burying the lead at the end. Um, but my question has to do with an institution that I thought uh, was maybe a little bit missing from your analysis. Um, as you know, I've done a lot of research in Ukraine with so-called HIV service organizations, these NGOs that are kind of subcontracted sub now um, through the Alliance. Um, and they almost in every case work very, very closely with the local aid center right, in whatever city, town, region, or whatever they're working in. And so to me, it seems like this local aid center, the speed center, is kind of a, almost acts as a hybrid institution that is kind of quasi-state, quasi, I don't know, quasi-NGO. And some of these HIV service organizations even have Kind of a little room or a little reception area in the local aid center. So I wondered, could you think more about what role these local aid centers play? And is that something that might add to your analysis when you're thinking about, you know, polycentricity and um, these kinds of relationships that you're looking at? Definitely. Yeah. Um, it's just, um, I think that maybe what I, um, haven't been able like to do really successfully in this paper is to talk about the difference between these I don't know like the state level point of view so to speak and again like the situation on the ground because as you like zoom in and zoom out like situation the things really change right and um I was like more focusing on the like these like various beliefs and information rules and like you are right in that like I overlooked some of the like local dynamics that is happening on the ground and I think that uh, the aid centers these speed center they are really like important like entities that basically tie together the like state sector so to say and all these and and all these NGOs so they kind of like serve like as a as a bridge between the two and um I think, and yeah, I think that probably I should have like made it more, um, I should, probably should have like made, made it clear that the, um, that the separation, so to say, between like the state and the NGOs, it is, it seems like really, really clear, clear as you go like higher up, but as you then um, zoom in and as you go like all the way down, then it's kind of like more blurry, more blurry on the ground. But I think that it kind of like it still um, it still holds in the sense that um, it is really interesting and that it is really um, important to see basically who is right like who's working on the ground with the target communities and basically how these people like present themselves to the target communities and whether they are um, so to say doing this like peer to peer approach because yeah. Like when I was um, in the film myself, I saw that this like peer-to-peer -peer, um, approach, it was like really important. And basically like often like your ability to reach the target community and your like perception by the target community, um, it really depended on whether they would like perceive you as to be as like, well, it's one of ours or it's kind of like one of theirs, you know, like, and you face that 
who you may not want to do a lot of things with. But yeah, those um, hybrid institutions, they kind of like change a little bit the dynamics um, on the very local level. Thank you, Daphne. Saria, did you have any follow up there? Or are you uh, good for now? Well, I guess just to follow oh, up sure. to, yeah, to, to think about would be does, does the IAD framework accommodate this kind of hybrid institution? Um, that would be my follow up, not anything that you have to answer here, but just something to, to think about going forward. It's just like a brief comment that what I think is really like useful in the IAD is that like it's not really rigid. So we can like tweak it like to accommodate the situation that the situation that we are analyzing. And I think that for instance, like when we are talking about like participants, we can accommodate these hybrid institutions, for instance, there. And when we are also like talking about like attributes of the community, I think that's like another place where hybrid institutions would um potential fit. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks so much, Daphne. And thanks again. Great question, Sarah. Uh, McKinsey, I think you are next. Uh, thank you. I was, my question is just to clarify something. When you're discussing uh, how this uh, polycentric framework works at the local level, uh, could you, could you define local for me? Are we talking down to kind of rural villages as the local level or regional centers as, as the local level? Yeah, great question. Thanks. Like as an anthropologist, we often like are caught in this like local global uh, dichotomy. And yeah, yeah, we sometimes like forget to define what we're talking about. So yeah, thanks for uh, like pushing me to do that. So yeah, when I'm talking about the local level, the level on the ground, I'm usually talking about kind of like the like so to say like the village level or to or like a small town or like a small town level. Where there is, I don't like, um, where there is um, like people from the target groups who are like to work with, and basically like where we see this like influx of people who work either for the Ministry of Health or who the like sub uh, contractors, the sub recipients of the um, alliance, um, who are like people who are going there. Does it clarify things? Does it help or? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Um, and, oh, yeah, Jamie, did you have a follow-up there? But yeah, please feel free. I do have a follow-up. Yeah. Just as you think about the difference between global level and local level, remember too, Lynn talked about, and you, obviously you didn't talk about this in your presentation today, so you've probably already done this work and I don't just don't know about it. But just this idea that as looking at local levels, like that's a different level of the IAD framework. And that's just so, cool to me that Lynn's work allows us to do that, to think about the IED framework on so many levels. Um, it complicates things, but it also helps us recognize that we're like dealing with problems that um, don't have easy answers. So, yeah. So as you think about the local level, I'll just say, if you haven't done it already, but I'm assuming you did, make sure that you think, like reconceptualize what goes in the, what components go in that framework, because it's going to look different from um, the, way the, 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 way, the way you put the components in the framework right now. Yeah, that's a, that's that is a great point. It's like so far the framework that I have like drew on the basis of the ID framework, I think it's it's kind of like fuzzy in that way because it doesn't allow for this like distinction between the local and the global. But like as you and Mackenzie have uh, pointed out, and as like Sarah was um, prompting me to do, I think that yeah, uh, like as I go forward with this and as I um, take like little. Uh, take a deeper dive into the policy centricity. I think that I'll have to kind of like tease out like a few more frame, a few more um, like not, not frameworks, but like a few more um, like figures out of this like initial like adaptation of the IAD figure like to account for these like different like levels. Yeah, that I'm talking about. Talking about. Yeah, this thing that I have shown you at the very beginning, it's a, it's a drop one, it's kind of like something that I put together like as an inspiration that helped me to think things through. Click the wrong button, sorry. Okay, 
Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, and we have only have a few minutes left if there's any other final questions that occur to folks. Um, oh, sorry, Renzo. Yeah, I didn't see you there. Please feel free. Levna, thanks for a great presentation and a very interesting and well-written paper. Uh, congratulations for that. Um, my question is just a clarifying one. Um, how decentralized is healthcare provision in general uh, in Ukraine? And um, I miss, may have missed this, but um, and how much of that, uh, how much of the of addressing the HIV epidemic is implemented through more local uh, healthcare providers representing the Ministry of Health or specific regions in the country? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I probably should have like made it more clear. So like this, um, this system of like healthcare um, that Ukraine inherited from the USSR, it was really a centralized system. It was called like the Samashka system. So there you have these like Ministry of Health that is located at the capital city. And then um, this ministry like has its um, like own entities in the um, in every like other big cities, and then under the, um, those uh, in those in then not in the cities, but like in the like smaller part of the cities, you have like smaller entities. But in the end, it's kind of like a top. It 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 used to be like a top down thing. So um why I have like spent a lot of time talking about these like transformation like reorganization in the um, public um, health system. It's because like one of the attempts is basically to decentralize, to decentralize the system, to make it kind of like less rigid and like less top down. So those like centers of public health, these partly new, partly like reorganized entities out of the like old ones that I have mentioning, they are now basically being created in um, in like in every um, basically in the center of the every region and they are like kind of like still created under the aegis of the Ministry of Health but they are kind of like less dependent on the ministry and they are now being charged with kind of like epidemiological monitoring on the local level and also with the response to HIV AIDS on the local level so um, does it partly address what we were talking about? Sorry, sometimes I, I go off on a tangent and start talking about things that I find interesting. So please steer me back to the path if I, if I go off on a tangent. Well, for me, it was very clear. I was just wondering when, when you referred to the ministry and the centers, is that focused on uh, on the central level of government when, when it was managed at the central level or when it was more decentralized? Yeah, so like the centers, the, these newly created centers, it's this attempt at decentralization basically. They are kind of like more independent, like more autonomous. Thank you. Fantastic, no, great question, Renzo. Um, and wonderful job again, Daphna. Hopefully that wasn't too rough, right? <laughs> I thought you did. I thought you did great. Were there any final remarks or reflections that you had before uh, we wind things up here? Or like you said, I know a lot of this is depending on field work, which hopefully we can get scheduled and actually will take place um, later this year. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your a really. Um, thought-provoking questions. I now think that I have, that I now, I know basically how like to restructure this paper. So the future dissertation chapter looks more cogent, like makes maybe like a more like persuasive argument. And thank you really so much for all your thoughts and questions. Now I have a lot of stuff to work with. Thank you, Daphne. Maybe one last round of applause. That's okay, really, really well done. Um, and like I said, I'll definitely put you in touch with Mike as well, just in case you two can find a time to brainstorm um, on the polycentricity front. So thank you all so much again for joining another great discussion. Hope you have a wonderful uh, and warm <laughs> rest of the afternoon. It looks like 40s and 50s are coming next week, so we got to enjoy it, right, while it lasts. Um, and if not before, I look forward to seeing you guys at the colloquium uh, next Monday. So thanks so much again, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. Take care. Thanks again, Daphne.